Today we are in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, just, just one verse, verse 18. And before we start, uh, Doug wanted me to mention that, that Randy Bigner is in the, in the hospital, uh, Don's brother uh, at Lutheran, uh, so we can be praying for him as well. Uh, Ephesians 5, 518. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. You're, you're a God of grace and you're a God of abundance. You give us more than we need. And we thank you. You're a God who, who fills us. And you fill us to encourage us and, and to use us, God. And you transform us. We thank you that you do that uh, so we can be more like you and share in your holiness according to your grace. And we thank you for this next installment of grace uh, through your word uh, that we can see where you are leading us and be excited to be filled as we follow. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So in the gospel of, of, or the good news of John, uh, there, we see a, some, there's a group of guys, uh, lot, I'm sure you guys know, know them, uh, a lot of them were real rugged guys, fishermen, uh, who were following Jesus. And I mean, have you ever met a, a full-time fisherman? Or maybe someone uh, is in the shrimp boat business, or uh, maybe crabbing. What, what's the show called, The Deadliest, Deadliest Catch? Yeah. I think I said, maybe you watched that. Those guys, those seem pretty tough guys, aren't they? Uh, well, Jesus had a lot of guys that were fishermen that followed him. A lot of tough guys, I would, I would say, and they were dealing with some, some fear. They were worried, troubled. What could cause them, such tough guys, to get so worried, to get so trouble, troubled? And, and guys like, uh, like Pete, Peter who said, hey, we've left everything to follow you. Guys that are bold. Now, what could cause them, uh, for Jesus to say, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. What, what could have led to that? Well, back in uh, 2011, something, something strange started to happen with Apple. Uh, the, the stock prices started to slowly go down, all the way down to about 44% than what it was, less than 40% less. So it was at 702, and in the fall of 2011, it, it started and, and eventually got down to 390. So from 702 to 390, what could have caused $300 billion worth to shareholders to be lost there? Anybody want to take a shot at that one? Competition. No. Death of a certain person. Thank you, Doug. Steve Jobs passed away, October fifth, two thousand and eleven. Their their leader was gone. Apple's leader, CEO, he was he was gone, and we saw that in the stock prices as they slowly declined. Thankfully, they they, they recovered. I wouldn't be using this today, probably, <laughs> if they didn't. But they they recovered. But they were in a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear because the leader was gone. And that's much like what happened with Jesus' followers, these tough guys that encountered some fear. Jesus told them, he said, I'm going to leave you. And they got fearful. He said, one day I'm, I'm going to be gone. But don't worry, I won't leave you as orphans. But he said, I'm, I'm going to be gone. So they were fearful. And in that moment, uh, that was... Uh, during the Last Supper, so it was, he was just about to be crucified. But a few days later, he rose from the dead, and they were with him. The Bible says in Acts, over a period of 40 days, Jesus gave convincing proofs to, over, as Paul says, over 500 people, uh, gave convincing proofs of his resurrection for up to 40 days after his resurrection. And then he left again. He left and he ascended into heaven. And we see 
Uh, even though these guys experienced the resurrection, there was still some timidity because uh, they didn't, they weren't quite preaching the gospel yet, were they? They weren't preaching Jesus yet. They were praying privately. What could have led from them going to private prayer and then to public preaching, which we read of in the book of Acts in chapter 2? Well, as many of you probably know, the coming of this certain person, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that Jesus promised. And he said, when, when he promised the Spirit, he said, hey guys, wait here. I'm gonna, he's ascending. When he, he, he ascended into the heaven, he said, wait here for the promise that my Father will give to you, that I will send to you. Wait in Jerusalem. I wonder why he, he said wait there. Why did he say wait? Stay in Jerusalem and wait. Well, because soon there will be a group, large group of people, Jews, who were commanded to be there for a certain festival. That's called the Festival of Weeks, or the Day of, day of Pentecost. Uh, if you don't know where those names came from, the Festival of Weeks, it's really, it's called that because there's a week pretty much for each day of the week. So seven days of the week, seven days a week, that's seven times seven, 49 days. So 49 days after Passover, or we can round up to 50, right? Uh, Pentecost means, pente means, means 50. So it's 50 days after Passover, and then the Jews would come back, they would go back to Jerusalem, and they would celebrate. They would celebrate the giving of the law, when, when God gave the law through Moses at Sinai. And most likely, there was more people there for Pentecost than for the Passover, and why? Because of a better traveling conditions. The traveling conditions were a lot better. So this is, so he says, Jesus says, wait. Uh, wait for, wait until the Spirit comes. And he sends the Spirit when? Day of Pentecost, when all, majority of Jews are there in Jerusalem. And in order to share the good news, to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, the new covenant that has just formed in the blood of Christ. And to the Jews first, right? God stayed in, in line with, he was consistent with his ways, as he says, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. We kind of see that when how the Gospels are ordered. Uh, the first Gospel written is the Gospel of Mark, the earliest. So you think, why, you know, why is it Mark first? Well, it's Matthew because Matthew is the most Jewish. It's the most Jewish oriented gospel, so first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. God shows us, shows us that. And another question is, why, why would Jesus make them wait all alone? You know, why didn't he just stay there, leave, and then the next day they have the Spirit? They don't have to go through such pain waiting. Uh, the worst thing could be is just waiting. I don't, I don't know about you, but I hate when I just have to, I have to wait for something. Well, I, I believe so that they can see and that we can see. So this is probably, they probably had to wait about a little bit over a week. Because you think that Jesus was there for about 40 days after Passover. Pentecost is 50 days uh, after. So a little bit over a week. I believe Jesus made them wait so they could see. And so we can see that we cannot share the gospel without the Spirit. We can't do the work of God without the, without the Spirit of God. Now, we can do our own kind of work. We can get people in a building, but we can't get them into the kingdom without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. So that's why I believe he made, he made them wait, and that's the reason that we're, share, we're here today is to, while well, I'm sh sharing this message today, is that each and every one of us, we're equipped. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit, we're, we're not supposed to share. We can't share the gospel without the Spirit. And so when the Spirit came, there was what? What happened? Some things you wouldn't forget. A violent wind, and there was some fire, too. I mean, it says violent wind, so we're thinking tornado. You know, really strong wind, enough to get the sirens off, the tornado sirens off, at least. 
Strong wind, and wind helps, it represents God's presence. Much like, you know, Elijah's thought when he was on Mount Carmel, and he, he, he was waiting to hear from the Lord, and the Lord was going to pass by, he said. And then he said he saw, you know, what seemed like a whirlwind, right? So he was assuming that's where God was, but God was actually in the still small voice, but it was the, we see that's the thought, God's presence, wind. And also, there was fire, fire too, that showed God's presence. But that word uh, for wind in the Greek is, is pneuma. And for the, in the Hebrew, that the Old Testament is written in is ruach. And they both, they both mean breath or, or, or wind. That, that word for spirit, I'm sorry, the word for spirit uh, shows us it means breath, the breath of God or, or wind. The spirit of God is the breath of God. And then we see when that, when that wind came, then these tongues. And you couldn't forget this. You see a, a, a flaming tongue on fire, on top of someone's head, you're not going to forget that. Huge symbolism that, that God was, was given here. He's saying, I'm in the house, and there's a reason why it was, a, it was a tongue. Now, these guys that were in the room, as they, the ones with the tongues on top of their heads, they started speaking, not in tongues, but in other tongues. See, we have, we have to know the difference. You could get confused and say, oh, yeah, if you're a believer, you have the spirit, then you have to speak in tongues. That's not what God is saying here. It says in other tongues. We see the difference. Paul shares it in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. He's talking about love. But he says, if I were to speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I'm just a resounding gong. So we see those two. There's a difference. There's tongues of Men, tongues of angels. Tongues of angels is more the, that's the heavenly language, the language of God that requires an interpreter, right? But here it was the, the languages of men. So like today, you know, French, Spanish, German, uh, Liberian, is that right? Liberian. Uh, these guys, which were, they, these guys were Galileans. And Galileans, they had a thick accent, strong Galilean accent, a crude accent, kind of like in Pittsburgh, where I'm from, <laughs> down there. It's a kind of crude, strong accent. You knew that person was from Pittsburgh, and here you knew this person was from Galilee. If you remember Peter, when, when the disciples fled, when Jesus got arrested, the disciples fled, but Jesus, Peter followed him all the way to the, to the court of the high priest. But they, 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 they recognized he was a follower of Jesus because of his thick Galilean accent. So this is a crude accent, and these guys were speaking the other languages of those, the other different native languages that people were, had that were visiting from Pe Pentecost perfectly. Perfect inflection, exactly uh, the right accent for that, for that type, for that language, for that native language. Language And they were like, man, how are these guys doing? They're, they're sharing the wonders of God in another language. God enabled them to speak that language. And it shows us, shows us why, why the Spirit is given. They declare the wonders of God. And shortly after, what does Peter do? He shows a lot of boldness now, and he's preaching in public. Preaching in public to his fellow Israelites and he, pretty bold, he says, yeah, you put him on the cross. You guys, you, you did this. Uh, but God raised him from the dead. And so, at, the end, at the end, they say, what do we do? We'll repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord, for the forgiveness of your sins. So we see that the Spirit is given to preach the gospel. The main reason, the primary reason we have the Spirit is to communicate the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, now notice when, when Jesus did promise back in John, those guys that were fearful, uh, when he did promise that spirit, he, he didn't say uh, when the spirit comes, he didn't say, uh, I'm sorry, in the book of Acts, he didn't say when the spirit comes, he didn't say you'll, you'll receive tingles. Although you can. You, sure, you surely can. But Jesus didn't say it. He didn't say you're going to feel tingles. He didn't say... You're, you'll know it by the spiritual high that you have. Or you know you've received the Spirit because you start comparing yourself and you say you have greater faith than somebody else. What did he say? You will receive, receive the Spirit 
You will receive power from on high, and you will what? Be my witnesses. So you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. He, he emphasized the Spirit is given to be a witness to those that don't know Christ. So we see the main reason we, we get the gift, the gift of the Spirit, is so that we can be a gift to the world, so that we can use our tongues to go out and communicate the gospel to those that need to hear it. So I, I would say if we're going to be full of the Spirit and near to the Spirit of, of God, most likely we're going to be full of witness and near to the lost. Not being of the world, but as, as Paul says, in the world, not of the world, intentionally influencing the world for Christ. I remember time my, my, my former days uh, when I was younger and I was, I was new to faith and surely was on fire for God. I, would, I guess I'd say I'd have a fire in my heart, had a fire in my heart and time in my hands. I had a lot more time back then. So a lot of friends and I, we, we'd go late night. Uh, we'd have go, go for a, a young adult Bible study or actually worship service. And then we'd all travel. The service would get out around 9.30, 9 30, 10 o'clock. We'd travel down um, to the south side of Pittsburgh where all, you know, all the bars are, a big strip of bars, a lot of nightlife. And we'd have, we'd have Bible studies there. But we would do that. And we'd go to a friend of mine, uh, Brian and I, we'd go to different places and go to different friends and really want to just share our testimonies with them. Every opportunity we, we got, uh, we would do that. And then one time he had his friend that he knew from his previous life, uh, this guy was, he knew that he was still on heroin. He was still struggling uh, with heroin. So we unabrasively went to his workplace. Uh, he, was, he was a cook at, at a bar. And this is uh, downtown Pittsburgh, not the south side, but this is uh, near downtown Pittsburgh, and so what's, uh, what's happening is we, we walk into this bar, and we ask to, to speak with them, and we had to wait, so we just sat at the bar, and, and we waited, and then we saw a victim. Right next to us, uh, there was a girl there drinking, and we were like, we got to get the gospel uh, into her, her hands, or we wanted to share our testimonies with her, and she was very open, and, and we got to, and nothing Nothing amazing happened or visible happened right there, but we got, to, we got to share our stories of how we came to Christ, how Christ delivered us from our bondage and made us whole. Well, a few weeks later, we're down the south side of Pittsburgh where we had our Bible study, and uh, what would happen, we had the Bible study, and we'd go out, you know, we'd, we'd witness to people once the bars got out, but as we're getting to go into the coffee shop, you know, I parked the car, it took, it took a while to find a spot. It was really busy, but parked the car. I was about to enter into the coffee shop. It's called the Beehive, by the way. Uh, going into the coffee shop, and we realized there's two, two girls that we knew from the worship service that joined us. These two girls, I mean, they're like innocent like doves. Uh, they were happy-go-lucky, very innocent girls that decided to join us in a rough side of Pittsburgh where there's a lot of drunk people. You know, and you, know, you don't know what's going to happen. But they d decided to join us, and we couldn't find them. They got, we just, before I got into the coffee shop, realized, oh, they're not here. And they're lost. So we had to go walk around the strip, you know, walk around uh, uh, all the different bar where all the bars are, the big nightlife, trying to find these girls. And thankfully, we do. We, we, we find them, and they're just kind of giggling and talking to, to someone at a bus stop. So we, 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 we talked to them, we greeted them for a little bit at the bus stop, and we're like, hey, you ready to go to have the Bible study? And I'm like, oh yeah, let's go, let's go. So right when we're about to leave the bus stop, the bus pulls up, and someone gets off. And right on time, it was that girl, that girl from a couple of weeks ago, and she looked at me and my friends like, you know, look in her face, you know, really a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Or a look on someone's face is worth a thousand words, and she says, yeah, I think about you guys all the time. Every time I see a steeple, I think of you guys. Uh, that tells me, I don't know, you know, if she came to faith, but God was working on her. I share that, you know, I share that story because, not in, part, in part, to show ways that the Spirit can lead us to the right place, 
at the right time. But the second part, the main reason I share that is because during that whole time, that whole experience uh, that I got to have uh, going out witnessing people uh, on the weekends, that's when I really felt the closest to the Spirit, when I was focused on witness, witnessing, sharing my faith with others. Yes, I surely have had moments where I've gone to a conference, I've gone uh, in a Bible study, I sense God's presence, see the Spirit work and get excited. But this, those times when we were out witnessing, it was a common occurrence uh, that God's, uh, the God coincidences, you might say, happened over and over. And I felt, surely saw a lot of the evidence of the Spirit, uh, the joy, the peace I shared, that I got to share in. I felt the closest to the Spirit as I was uh, witnessing. You might be here today, you might feel like, oh, I feel kind of dry in my faith. I'm, you know, trying to serve the Lord and, and I'm, you know, reading my Bible, uh, attending church regularly. Maybe you're like, man, something's just missing. It might just be that. Maybe you're not feeling near to the Spirit or full of the Spirit. Maybe it's, you just need to change the direction a little bit, put it towards the lost. More of your energies towards friends at work that don't know the Lord or family that do not, do not know him. Well, last week we talked about a little bit about not, not, grow, not growing in complaint, but growing in, in Christ. To be an externally focused church, internally strong. Good worship, good small, small groups, preaching of the word, yet externally oriented. Oriented to, to reaching the lost and the marginalized in our community. And, you know, if you haven't heard that message, you weren't here last week, please listen to it. Because, not because I preached it, but because it's important for us as a church, as a direction we want to go. And where our prayers are, are to go as well as, as we decide what kind of changes do we need to make to reach the lost. To go from not being a member-driven church, like I said, three-quarters of churches are member-driven churches, and a lot of churches are going down, but to be a mission-driven church. So the next three months, we're going to be, we're all praying about that. What's direction? What, where is God leading us? What kind of changes this conference that we had to go through to do so, to become a member-driven church, to seek and to save that, that which is lost? Well, after that sermon, if you were here last week, and after, the, you know, maybe this past week, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't, know, I don't know how to preach the gospel. Or something. I don't know how to even have the courage to share my faith. I can't do it. I can't do this. If you said that, you're right. If you said, I can't do this, you're right. But I am, can. God has known when, when he came to Moses, Moses said, who should I say sent, sent me? Tell him that I am sent me. That was a name for God. If, it's right. If you can't do it, the I can't do it, but the I am can and if you say you can you really can't do it but Christ in you can do it CIY Christ in you can do it who is your hope of glory and the spirit can do it and it's not, and it's not about my ability it's not about your ability it's not about ability but it's about availability availability to the spirit listening to the spirit and going where where he leads us about a year ago, you know, before, uh, before I assumed this position here as senior pastor, I, you know, I had a, I was struggling a little bit. I, I was feeling a little overwhelmed. I was like, I, I don't know if I can do it. I honestly don't know. I, mean, I was getting ready uh, to go drive the bus early in the morning. And I just had that thought, like, I don't know if I could do it. I was feeling overwhelmed. As soon as I got in the car, turned on the radio, Preacher on the radio, first things that I hear, it says, you can't do it, but Christ in you can, but God can. And I, I came to share that with you, you, with all you guys today. You can't do it, but Christ in you can as, as we submit and follow him. He can be the one that leads us and, and gives us the words and the opportunities to lead others to the Lord, who otherwise will be really discomfort. And a lot of discomfort forever, right? But what did Jesus say? Did he say, apart from me, you can do a little bit? 
No, he said, apart from me, me and the Spirit, you can do nothing. Can't do anything for the kingdom. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Let's just say that together. That word, nothing. Ready? One, two, three. Nothing. nothing. Does that feel good? <laughs> we can do nothing good for the kingdom apart from him. We're, we're to be wholly dependent on the Holy Spirit. Wholly dependent on the Holy Spirit. Like the, the, like the apostles and the new believers that began the church age in Acts, as we see, these are a group of people that were wholly dependent on the Holy Spirit. Tozer uh, has a quote. I think I've shared this a couple years ago. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on, and no one would even notice. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everybody would take notice. And that might be a good question for our, our personal lives. If the Spirit left, my, left me right now, how much of a change would there be? Well, at, the, at the beginning of the message, I had to talk about those guys that were, that were troubled. And Jesus later said in that chapter, John chapter 14, you might be troubled, but he says later on you're going to receive a helper, an advocate, which is what we're talking about, the, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. And the Greek word there is parakletos. And I know you, you guys didn't take Greek, probably don't care about that word at all, but, but what it means is uh, either to stand with you in court as an advocate or one who comes alongside you. Back then, Jesus, his first hearers, his original hearers would have thought the Roman army right then, come alongside, because Roman soldiers, they were shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, front and back to back, front to back. They were, and that's where we get that phrase, I've got your back. All right, I've got your back. He's got our back uh, to help us in the fight, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who is alongside of us and who is in us as believers to help us in the, not just in the fight against temptation, but in the fight to win the lost. I've, I've uh, quoted from Muhammad Ali before. I know uh, you guys paid attention to that. Uh, I got Muhammad Ali, greatest fighter ever, right? He didn't do it. He, he didn't become the greatest fighter all alone. He had a corner man. Anybody know his name? Angelo Dundee. Angelo Dundee, he had a corner man. He didn't do it alone, and we're not meant, and we can't do it alone as we fight to reach the lost. Now, you might not have heard this word before, but uh, there are two types of ififications. Two types of ififications that we experience as followers of Jesus. First one, Justification. Justification, that's, that's one and done. That's, I'm justified, uh, appearing as if I didn't even sin. My, my sin debt taken away. That, that's automatic immediately when I become a believer, put my faith in Christ. But then there's another one, sanctification. Sanctification, that starts at belief, but it's a whole lifetime. A whole lifetime of the Spirit working on us really to, to, look, to look like Christ. Sanctification, being made holy, being made to look more like Jesus. The invisible work of God in the visible believer. The invisible God in the visible believer. The Holy Spirit, God in our skin, working, working on us and transforming us, which of course is a great, one of the greatest witnesses we could have is a transformed life. And like I said, every one of us in here, everyone in here has the spirit who is a Christian. If you place your faith in Christ and you're following Christ, you have the spirit. As we see in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of the holy God? The spirit of God dwells in you or lives in you. Or Romans 8.11, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And if that's not enough, 2 Timothy 6, 7. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And you might have heard people say, hey, are you a spirit-filled Christian? Every person is a, really a spirit-filled. Every Christian has the spirit. You might, the confusion might be, uh, this might, well, this might help. So D.L. Moody, anybody heard of D.L. Moody? Moody Bible Institute? D.L. Moody is a story of, uh, of, a, of a church who was needing some help uh, to go out and to reach the lost, to go out and to impact their community. And they're thinking, oh, we got to get Moody in here. You get Moody. He was the big, big timer back then. He was the big evangelist guy uh, back then that everybody wanted to ha- have come to their church. And so as they're discussing, uh, one, of the, one of the men in the group says, you know what, I'm tired of hearing about Moody this, Moody that. What, is, you know, what do we think? Do you think Moody has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? Uh, a younger Humble gentleman stood up and says, Sir, we don't believe that Moody has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. But we can surely believe that God, that the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. See, really, it's not, you know, we don't get more of the Spirit, really, it's the Spirit gets more of us, that we submit more to Him, and it's more apparent. Wait, okay, I got, I got some helpers today, Alex and Hira. Uh, they're going to come up on stage here. They got some water here. Uh, so you guys can start getting ready. Just come on up and get, get your cups ready. Ephesians 5, 18, like I said, it says, uh, don't get drunk on wine leading to debauchery or on anything else for that matter, but be influenced uh, by the Spirit. Be filled by the Spirit. Now, nine out of ten times in the Bible, nine out of ten times, we see this word being, about being filled in the Spirit nine, ten times in the Bible, in the New Testament. Nine of those times, it's about a specific person getting filled. This time in Ephesians 5, is the, it's the only time that it's an imperative, a command. And it's a present tense command. So you can pretty much say, keep being filled by the Spirit. Allow it to continually influence you. All right, so with our illustration today, so Kira's going to go first. Uh, tell everybody what's in your hand, Kira. I don't know how to say it. Alka Seltzer. Seltzer. Yeah. I could use them right now. I'm getting a little dry. <laughs> Alka Seltzer. All right, so, and that's what Alex has as well. But, all right, Kira, go ahead and drop it in the water. Now, do you agree there's Alka-Seltzer in the water? There's Alka-Seltzer in the water. Now, all right, now, Alex is going to put some in, but he's, he, he's, removing the, he's removing the tablets from the, from the what is that thing called, a little foil package. All right, so one more. Put them both in. Now, surely there is Alka-Seltzer, right? I don't think one will be going to, one's enough. All right, overachiever here. All right, so uh, as you can see, there is Alka-Seltzer in there. There's Alka-Seltzer in both, right? But the one is in the packet. Uh, beautiful illustration. Uh, I heard this one from Dan Hamill, who's a preacher in our, in our movement. He's actually preached at CIY before. But uh, the first one, as we see, that the spirit is in us. As every, every believer, we have the spirit in us. The second one it's really submission to the Spirit, and we see more of its effect. It's more visible, the Spirit that is in us, uh, and, it's, and it's working. We see others can notice uh, that it's working in us. And really, the package is really, we would say, that's grieving the Spirit. You know, the Spirit, those times where we're in, living in unrepentant sin, the Spirit speaks and gets specific with us, Stop doing this or start doing this, and we don't do it. Uh, 
and we just left, it looks like we don't, we're not filled. But as we listen to the Spirit, and He leads us, uh, there's more evidence of the Spirit in us, and we can be uh, more cl- closer, we can be closer to the Spirit. You guys can s- sit down. So, so as, as we close today, like I said, as, you know, as we're, gonna, we're seeking to be a church that goes out, we don't want to just, we don't want to occupy pews, but we want to go out uh, and occupy hearts. We want to go out and f- impact hearts, impact people for our community. As we do that as Christians, we have, every one of us have the Spirit, and uh, He speaks to us. And so as, as, we, as we close here, I say, is there an area in your life where God is speaking, where the Holy Spirit is saying, uh, stop this or do this so that the Spirit, can, you can be labeled as a person that is filled, filled with the Spirit, almost overflowing uh, with the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that not one of us can really, we, none of us can earn your favor. Your favor, your grace is a gift and your, your Holy Spirit is a gift that we receive as believers. God, help us to, to use it uh, for the main reason, to go out to reach the lost, to draw close to be more like Christ, and to go out and to reach the lost. God, we thank you that you, you are available. The Spirit is available to each and every one of us. Help us to use it for your sake and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.